In this video, we're going to investigate an interesting application of integrals, which is finding the volume of solids, specific solids that you're able to find by taking a function and revolving it around an axis. Let me show you what that means. This first question says, determine the volume of the solid created by rotating y equals 2 over 3rd x around the x-axis. So first of all, let's start off by just doing a quick sketch of 2 thirds x. So 2 thirds x, gonna cross the x-axis. Um, one of the, if we just follow the slope, two over three, so rise of two, run of three, we know it's also gonna go through this point here, right? So um, I can quickly use the ruler and draw a straight line representing that. Okay, there we go. So now we have that line and the question is, what do we mean by rotating this around the x-axis? Well, first of all, it actually says just between um, 0 and 3, right? So basically what I'm looking for is I'm going to take the area in here. Let me highlight that. This area in here. And we know how to find that area, right? Just using a little bit of integration. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take that area and we're going to turn this whole thing 3D. And what we're actually gonna do is we're going to rotate that around the x-axis. Clearly this is the x-axis here, right? So we're gonna basically bring this area out of the page and revolve it 363 degrees, sorry, 360 degrees around that point, which is gonna basically create this three-dimensional sort of cone shape. Well, it is a cone shape, right? So if you can imagine that being swept out around that point, and making essentially a cone. I actually do have, I took a screenshot of a, of a 3D representation of this to hopefully make it a little bit clearer. So here it is off to the side. Um, this is a GeoGebra applet that allowed me to revolve this exact curve around the, um, the x-axis. And you see, so basically this was the x-axis and the, this was the y-axis, this flat sort of gray plane here. And what we did is we sort of took that into 3D and revolved it around that x-axis. So we, we end up getting a cone. And the volume here, the, the GeoGebra app, actually calculates the volume for us. And it should, should come out to 4 pi. I'll include a link to the, the applet in the description so you can try experimenting with it yourself. So when we try to find the volume of this cone using integration, I mean, we could use the volume formula of a cone that we know, um, but let's do it using integration because we're gonna do some other shapes that aren't gonna be cones and we should know how to do it using integration. So the, the trick here is to look at one little slice, one cross section of this cone. So if we look at one cross section of this cone, I'm just gonna take sort of one cross section here at a given value of x. So whatever the x value is here, we'll just call it x, we'll keep it general. If we look at that cross section, we sort of just take that off to the side, that cross section is gonna have some radius, right? And it's gonna be a circle because we revolved it around that x axis. It's gonna have some radius r. And in terms of our equation here, what is that radius? Well, notice how the radius here is just essentially going to be, um, it's going to be the y value of whatever that x is, right? And we have a formula. We know that this is y equals 2 thirds x. So the radius in this case is just going to be equal to 2 thirds x, right? So this is basically going to be the radius at any point along this line, right? At any cross section along this line. So a good first step might be to find this area. So the area of any of these cross sections is just going to be equal to, well, we know the area of a circle is just pi r squared, right? And in this case, we know our radius is going to be 2 thirds x, right? So this is basically the area of each cross section. Now, we're trying to find the volume of this whole thing, not just the area of the cross section. So instead of looking at just a two-dimensional slice, Let's actually look at a tiny thickness. So we call this a disc. It's sort of like a little hockey puck almost, right? A very thin hockey puck with that cross-sectional area. And we can call the thickness of that hockey puck dx. And remember what dx means. dx is just a tiny, tiny little increment in x. It's infinitesimally small. It's a very, very small increment of x. So if we wanted to find the volume of that disc, it's just going to be the area of this 
cross-section times the thickness, and the thickness is just dx, right? So the volume of this disk is just going to be pi times 2 thirds x squared dx, right? That's the volume of the disk. And here's where the calculus comes in. How do we find... Basically what we're going to do is we're going to try to find all those little disks along this whole length and add them up, right? So a tiny little disk here, a tiny little disk here, disk here, and if we add up all those volumes, we should get this whole thing. And that's essentially what an integral is, right? An integral is just the sum of a bunch of infinitesimally small things. So we can rewrite this volume of the whole cylinder as just the integral, so I'm going to write it over here, volume is just the integral of this thing, pi, two-thirds x squared dx. And we're doing it between the x values of 0 and 3. Luckily, we know how to evaluate this integral, right? I'm actually just going to pull the constants out. Um, so basically, we have v equals, well, pi we can pull out, right? And we have this 2 thirds here that's going to get squared. So that's going to end up being 4 ninths. And we can also pull that out, 4 ninths the integral between 0 and 3 of x squared dx, right? And now we take the integral, right? So it is a definite integral because it's between um, 0 and 3. So it's going to be pi times 4 ninths. And the integral of x squared is going to be x cubed over 3. And we're going to do this between 0 and 3. And if we do this, we know the zero one's going to go away, so we evaluate it at three, and then subtract it, evaluate it at zero. So it's going to be four, or sorry, pi times four ninths times, evaluated at three is going to be 27 over three minus zero. It evaluated at zero is just zero, right? So if we simplify this, we should get four pi, which is exactly agreeing with the answer that GeoGebra gave us, right? All the way over here, 4 pi. So there we go. All we did is we took that triangular area, rotated it around the x-axis, and we got a volume of 4 pi. Pretty cool, eh? We didn't actually need to use the volume of a cone formula or anything. We did it strictly with calculus. So I actually want you to pause the video here, and I want you to try the second question yourself. I also want you to try to visualize what this, uh, what this shape would look like if we revolved this x squared around the x-axis. I actually graphed it for you just to make it a little bit easier, but try to visualize what it is. Try it yourself. And when you think you have an answer or when you get super stuck, you can unpause the video and um, see what I got. So here's my solution. Um, the shape, by the way, that you're gonna get is sort of this Hershey kiss shape, right? It's sort of this curved in cone almost. Sort of looks like a cone, but it's got that curved in. Um, and I actually, I plugged this one into GeoGebra as well, so you can sort of see a better version of what it looks like. Um, it's, it's a cone like that. And again, GeoGebra tells us our volume is 32 over 5 pi, so that's what we should expect. Um, so to do this, I found the radius is just the function, x squared. The area of that is going to be pi times x to the 4, which makes sense, we're just squaring x squared. So the volume is just the volume of a little disk, of a single little disk in there is going to be pi x to the 4 dx, because dx is the thickness, should have done that, dx is the thickness of that little disk. And then in order to find the volume of the whole shape, we need to integrate between 0 and 2. So find all the little disks added up between here and here, and that's what we're doing. If you take that integral, you should get 32 over 5 pi. There we go. Now we have a bit of a different question. Same function, x squared, but now we're looking for the solid that's between, or sorry, that rotating that around the y-axis, right? So when we're rotating around the y-axis, we have to look for the values that go to the y-axis this time. So between y equals 1 and y equals 4, we're going to look for, oops, need the pen tool, uh, y equals 1 is there, and then y equals 4 is there. So we're essentially taking this area, let me highlight that for you, this area right here, getting all the corners there, 
and we're rotating this around the y-axis. So if you think about what that looks like now, so we're rotating this whole thing around the y-axis, going to look something, let's see if I can sketch this okay, something like that. We're rotating the top and the bottom and what's in between. So we're going to get sort of this bowl shape here with a flat bottom. And we're essentially looking for the volume of that shape now. Um, notice how it's cut off at the bottom um, because we're starting, we're integrating between one and four, not zero and four. So it's this sort of, it looks like a salad bowl almost that sits flat on a table. Um, so to, to find this volume, we need to do the same process essentially, but now we're going to sort of do everything to the y-axis. So let's think about what we did last time. We found sort of the radius of one of these disks, right? The radius of one of these disks, um, what is it going to be in this case? Well, we know this function that defines this shape is y equals x squared. So that height or that radius we need to find is going to be, essentially it's going to be in terms of y, right? Because it's going to depend on what the y value is. So we can easily rewrite this equation, basically just solve it for x instead. If we solve for x, we can just take the square root of both sides. So x equals the square root of y. Notice how there's usually two roots to this, the positive root and the negative root. But in this case, we're only working with the positive side. So we don't really need to worry about that. We're only working basically with the positive root of y. So the radius is essentially the root of y. So to find the area of that disk, it's going to be pi r squared, because that's the area of any circle, pi times root y squared, right? And if we turn that area into a disk, a three-dimensional disk with a thickness of this time, the thickness is going to be dy, because it's a small increment in the y direction, right? So because that's in the y direction, um, our volume is going to be, the volume of that disk is going to be the square root of y squared. Well, actually, we can just simplify that as just y dy. There we go. Now, to find the volume of the whole shape, we could do v equals and it's just going to be the integral between 1 and 4, because those are the values we're working with, of that thing, pi y dy. There we go. And, of course, we can just integrate this, pull the pi to the outside, and then the integral of y is going to be 1 half y squared, and we're going to evaluate that between 1 and 4. Okay, so not too bad evaluated at 4, we're going to get 16 over 2, and evaluated at 1, we're going to get 1 half. Okay, and you can simplify that as 15 over 2 pi. There we go. That's our volume. By the way, if you want to distinguish between this small volume here and this the, the volume of one disk and the volume of the whole thing, what I should have done maybe is call this lowercase v and call this one uppercase v, v just to differentiate between those two. Anyways, the volume ends up being 15 over 2 pi. So you see, it's a very similar process when we rotate something around the y-axis. Everything just needs to be in terms of y instead of x. Lastly, we have this type of question, where it's asking us to determine the volume of a solid created by rotating the region bounded by y equals x squared and y equals root x. So we're essentially taking this whole region between the two curves, which I graphed for you here, and we're rotating that around the x-axis. And what's that going to look, look like? Well, if you think about it, we're just going to rotate this point around like that, and we're going to end up with sort of, if we think about it, on the inside is going to be sort of that shape again. And what this is going to look like, it's basically going to look like a bowl that's hollow. Right, So it's like a bowl that you could put stuff in, almost. So on the inside, you can sort of look into it. A um, little bit hard to visualize, but hopefully you see uh, what I'm talking about here. Now, again with integration, we know how to find the integral, or the, the area between these two curves. We're just going to subtract the integral of the upper function minus the integral of the lower function to get sort of the difference between the two of them. It's actually very similar here when we're rotating that 
around the x-axis because essentially what we're doing is we're, we're finding the area of, or the volume created by this curve if we rotate that around we'd get a shape sort of like a bowl and then we're going to basically subtract we're going to carve out the middle of that by subtracting the volume of uh, created by this one which is one that we already found actually on the previous page so um, the other thing that's important here is we, we need to sort of find out ourselves where this ends and the bound of this is between, essentially the integral has got to be between zero and one. And we get that by finding the point of intersection of the two. Because I gave you the graph, it's pretty obvious, but sometimes you actually might need to find, um, you might need to find the boundaries yourself. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at two separate radiuses, right? The, we'll call this the blue radius here. And the blue radius is going to create a disc that looks something like that. And then we're going to have the red radius here, which is just goes to the red line. And we're going to basically have a hole in the middle that looks like that. So we're going to basically have two radiuses. And then we're going to create discs for each one of those and subtract them. So looking at the blue area first, the outer area or the upper area first, the area is just going to be pi r squared, where in this case r is the function root x, right? The blue one is the root x function. So we're just going to do root x squared, right? Which is just pi times x. So the volume of that disk right there is going to be pi x dx. So the volume created by that, uh, revolving that around the x-axis, Again, if we call this small v and we call it the big volume, the whole thing is going to be the integral of, sorry, between 0 and 1 of pi x dx, right? So that's going to be the volume of the outer one. And then we're going to subtract the inner one. So the area is pi r squared again. This time the, um, the inner function is x squared. So this is going to be x squared squared. So pi times x to the fourth is that area. So our little volume of our disk right there that we're going to subtract is going to be pi x squared, sorry, x to the fourth dx. And our integral, or the volume of that whole inner part, is going to be the integral between 0 and 1 of x to the fourth dx. Sorry, pi x to the fourth dx. And we're essentially just going to subtract these two integrals. You might notice there's a few things in common between these two, like there's a pi. So if we want the volume of the whole thing, I'll do it in black just to distinguish between those other two. Um, it's like we can factor a pi out of each one of those. And we can essentially do the integral between 0 and 1 of x dx minus the integral between 0 and 1 of x to the fourth dx. Now, if you do this, if you do the integrals, I'll let you do that yourself. Um, you should end up getting the answer as 3 pi by 10. That should be the final volume. Okay, try that yourself. Make sure you get that as an answer. Now, just to simplify sort of in a general case for these things, if we take a step back and look at our first few examples, um, in general, when we're revolving something around the x-axis, notice how we're always going to get, we're always basically going to be finding this area in this volume, and we're always going to be pulling the pi out to the outside, right? Because pi is a constant that's always going to be multiplied it because that's how you find the area of a circle, right? So in general, we can say the volume when we revolve something around the x-axis is going to be pi times the integral between whatever your start and your end point are. We'll just call them a and b. And then inside we got the radius, oops, the radius, which is a function in terms of x, and this is squared, right? Because pi r squared is the area of a circle. And then to turn it into a disk so we can actually find the volume, we're going to multiply it by dx. Again, that's exactly what we did in that example 1 and 2, right? This is sort of just the general formula for it. So it's a bit of a shortcut. The same thing goes for when we're revolving something around the y-axis, right? The only difference... So we're still doing it between a and b. We're still factoring out or removing that pi, I should say, from your integral because it's just a constant. It's pi r squared again, but this time our r is in terms of y. And 
we're taking that the disc is going to have a thickness of dy. There we go. And lastly, so we see that, by the way, in this question up here, right? It was the same thing. We took that pi outside of the integral to make it easier for us. And lastly, between two curves, uh, we're just going to be subtracting two radiuses, right? Or the, the areas that are created by two radiuses. So again, we can factor out that pi, and it's between some a and some b. But we're going to do the outer radius, r, in terms of x squared minus the inner radius. I'll call this small r x squared. And we can actually do this as one big integral. It doesn't matter if we have it as two separate integrals like this, or we put them together into one integral, right? Because integrals allow us to break it up into two separate ones or combine two things that are added. So either way, this way or this way, we get um, we will get the correct volume. Notice how this is in terms of x, so for revolving around the x-axis. So I'm going to put that in brackets here. This is around the x-axis. But if you're revolving it around the y-axis, I think you could figure out what that is. Just basically replace all those x's with y's, and you're going to be okay. One last little thing. This method, by the way, the first two methods that we did, so revolving something around the x-axis and the y-axis, this is usually called the disk method. So you might hear it referred to as the disk method because we're essentially looking at the little disks and summing them all up. And then this version where we have between two curves, we call that the washer method. And the reason for that is because each one of these cross sections using the washer method is going to look like a washer, like you would use for, um, for nuts and bolts and stuff like that. So it looks like a little washer like that, right? Because you're basically taking out a middle out of the... Um, out of that disc, right? So you're turning it into a washer. Anyways, those are what they're, they're usually called. That's what you might see in your textbook or online if you're doing some extra questions.